You were wrongfully accused of, of a war crime. I was in the SEAL teams uh, for 20 years. Uh, my last deployment uh, was to Missoula, Iraq in 2017. Near the end of that deployment, I was in charge. It was like three guys in my platoon had a uh, issue with me. It was like more of a personality conflict. Um, and then they came back about six months after that deployment and made an accusation, which it was a complete lie. So my wife and my brother both fought the government and the media for nine months uh, until my trial. She, she made a pretty big uh, headway, ended up getting on Fox News, and she got her points across so well that it got the president at the time, President Trump's attention. He looked into it and he actually got me out of prison. Welcome to the Better Human Podcast. My name is Greg Witz and each week we're gonna be bringing you some incredible and inspiring guests and topics that are gonna take your life to the next level. Thanks for spending time with us. Sit back and enjoy the show. Eddie Gallagher. Hey, how you doing? Good, you man? Good, good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. So why don't you tell me a little bit about some of the stuff that you're working on now? Uh, so yeah, right now, um, obviously we have the, uh, Pipe Hitter Foundation, uh, which we started, uh, shortly after I, I got out, uh, the military. So that, that keeps us, uh, pretty busy and it's also super fulfilling. Um, it's, you know, what we do is we step in for law enforcement, uh, first responders and active duty military, if they're being unjustly accused or, uh, you know, they're going sort of. Over the last, especially over the last two years, um, you know, we've had, a, we've helped a lot of law enforcement, uh, law enforcement officers out mm -hmm. due to whatever you want to call it, the woke agenda or whatever, um, that are getting unjustly persecuted. Uh, so we step in, we provide emergency relief funds, uh, for the families as they're going through that stressful time. We also raise money for their legal, uh, defense mm -hmm. and we will also advocate for them, um, Due to what we went through, uh, my wife and brother uh, both sort of uh, created this roadmap on how to defeat the media, um, defeat the, you know, the propagandist lies I put out or, you know, whatever you want to call it, fake news. Um, so we, we my wife, you know, obviously used social media uh, when I was locked up to get the truth out and to get the facts out. And then we also made um, a lot of good uh, relationships with uh, people in Congress, uh, people in certain positions that can help. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, those are there, they're uh, few and far between, but we did, uh, we do have some really good ones uh, like Ralph Norman uh, that are behind us. So we use all those contacts to help these individuals out. And, uh, you know, we've been going for three years now and we have a pretty good track record uh, so far. I mean, that's, that's all, you know, God, um, so, you know, we got that going on and then, you know, I'm down here locally in, uh, Destin, Florida. So I work, uh, at a range, um, that was just open this year. Um, uh, I teach. I've seen you know, some I, of your videos. They're badass. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's, it's a great range. So, uh, strong, bold, soft solutions. Um, it was, you know, these, um, uh, this Green Beret that I met, he had just recently got out. This was his vision. Um, Brandon Graves is a phenomenal human being, and he opened this range up. I helped him design it uh, when I first moved here, and we just became good friends. So I get to use the range to teach uh, basic to advanced shooting, uh, medical you know, classes, um, and then some home defense stuff, and also you know, uh, physical fitness. Um, and team building exercises. We, I've cool. recently got to take out a uh, high school team, uh, a boys, a senior high school team here locally, and just put them through a team building exercise and talk to them about overcoming adversity and what that means and how to become resilient uh, throughout their life. Um, and also the big thing I, I like to teach them is to stay away from having that victim mentality, which I think is been plaguing our society uh, for a long time now. And it's very easy for these kids to fall into that, to that victim mindset um, because it's sort of pushed on them. So I, I try and get them out of that and show them that, you know, no matter what happens to you in life, you don't have to play the victim role. It's all, you know, an obstacle that's put in front of you, put the work in, get over it and it'll pay dividends in the end. Um, so we've been doing, you know, I've been doing stuff like that. And then, you know, I have, uh, some partnerships, uh, with nine line, 
apparel and uh, a couple, a local gun store down here, which we sell rifles through. And, you know, it's just been, it's been uh, awesome. And, you know, the main thing I do um, is spend time with my family. That's, uh, that's priority number one. Um, you know, I, I prioritize that over everything else. So, you know, I, I try and keep my schedule loose um, just so I have more time at home. It's amazing. So uh, let's, let's back up. So have you seen, is, is there an increase in uh, law enforcement, military um, being unjustly accused? Like, have you seen an increase in that number over the last three years? Oh, big time. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with law enforcement, um, obviously over, you know, the past two years when the pandemic hit and then, you know, George Floyd and all that happened, um, you know, you just saw, you started seeing these law enforcement officers getting persecuted all over the country. Um, and I don't think that people understand, you know, I, I understand people's, uh, you know, uh, belief or whatever they want to think that, you know, some cops are bad, some cops are good. Um, you know, they're all human beings, human right. beings, good, bad. It's all a mixed bag. Um, but what I don't think people understand is when you persecute somebody and accuse them, you're not just persecuting and accusing them. You're, you're doing that to their family, to their friends. Um, and you're, you're literally putting them, uh, through a hellacious experience. Uh, it's very stressful. Um, and you know, have the, everybody that we've represented so far has been found innocent, um, which has been amazing. But at the same time, you know, I think, you know, from my experience, when I got done with my trial, you know, I was found innocent and everyone's like, Oh, victory. Well, yes, that is a victory, but then you have to deal with all the repercussions afterwards because the damage, the, the, branding, the branding is done. Right. I mean, it's hard to, to, yeah, it's hard for people to, to unhear that bell being rung. Right. I mean, I'm sure it was very difficult when it came down to neighbors and community and stuff and just trying to sort of navigate those relationships. Yeah, it, it is. It's a, it's just a different experience that you just have to sort of navigate your way through. Um, you know, they're usually the first uh, thing that people read is what they believe. And then anything else after that, they're just bouncing it off the first thing that's read. So, you know, when you're smeared in the media and these lies are put out against you, you're sort of having to combat that after you get out. Um, you know, and to the way I've combated it is you, you just be yourself and you just roll with the punches. Uh, you can't, you can't put too much emphasis on what people say or think, or, you know, obviously don't read the comments uh, is a huge one, but um, that's, you know, as far as our foundation, when people are put through that process, we help them sort of get back on their feet um, and also give them advice on how to navigate those waters. And just, I mean, we're into it. And just for the audience, uh, you were you were wrongfully accused of of a war crime. Yes. So, uh, well, can you just give us some of the details? Give us the overview. Sure. Uh, you know, I'll keep it brief because there's so much into it. And you know, I wrote a, a book about it, um, and all the details are in there. The book is called "The Man in the Arena." Right. Um, there is a lot of intricacies that go into this, the whole story of what happened to myself and my family, but. The overall gist of it is, you know, I, I was in the SEAL teams uh, for 20 years. Uh, my last deployment uh, was to Missoula, Iraq in 2017. Um, near the end of that deployment, um, the, I was in charge. Um, it was like three guys in my platoon had a uh, issue with me. It was like more of a personality conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, but these were younger dudes and they decided to escalate it uh, when they got back and try to do a little smear campaign, you know, through text messages, uh, going up to people, um, telling them little lies about me. And unfortunately for them, you know, I had been in the teams a lot longer than them. I had a pretty good reputation. I had a lot of friends. So people were coming to me and telling me if they were saying these things. Um, I ignored it. Uh, the command sort of told those guys to go decompress that they're, you know, everything they were saying was didn't add up. Um, and then they came back about six months after that deployment and made an accusation that I had stabbed an ISIS prisoner to death. Uh, that was under, or which it was a complete lie. Um, but it didn't matter at that point. Once that accusation was thrown out there, um, NCIS, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, got involved. And unfortunately, the lead investigator, uh, his name was Joe Warpinski was looking to make a career. Um, it was a, uh, 
a nasty uh, combination of ambition and incompetence. Um, and he sort of skyrocketed this uh, investigation and completely broke all investigative rules. Um, they raided my house. Uh, my wife and my, myself, and my wife weren't home. They pulled my kids out at gunpoint, um, you know, in the street in their underwear, um, raided my home. And then two months later, uh, they came on September 11th, 2018. They came and uh, locked me up. They threw me, they put me in military prison with no charges. Um, wouldn't tell me why they were putting me in there. It was just signed off by the Admiral, who was Admiral Colin Green at the time. And uh, that's where sort of the journey began. I got uh, locked up. And then once you're locked up in military prison, there's no bail system. Um, right. You're not leaving. You're, uh, you're called a... Uh, pre-trial prisoner. Um, so I sat in there for about nine months until my trial. Um, during that time, my wife uh, took to social media and started this organic social media campaign, getting the truth out about what was really going on. Because while she was doing that at the same time, the Navy uh, was putting out all sorts of misinformation about me to the media. Um, there was a uh, a parasitic journalist, uh, Dave Phillips from the New York Times, he personally got involved in the smear campaign. So my wife and my brother both fought the government and the media for nine months uh, until my trial. Uh, she, she made a pretty big uh, headway, ended up getting on Fox News um, or on uh, Fox and Friends in the morning. Um, and my wife is very, um, I don't know if people have ever met her or seen her talk, but she is she's a machine and she's got a just awesome personality. Um, but she's very strict and to the point. Um, and she got her points across so well that it got the president at the time, president Trump's attention. Wow. Um, he looked into it and he actually got me out of prison. He put a tweet out and said, Hey, let this man out of prison so he can defend himself before trial. Um, he wasn't saying I was guilty or not guilty. He was just said, give this man the rights he deserves before, because I was facing life in prison without parole. Um, that was what I was up against. So I was able to get out of prison uh, about two months before my trial. And um, we, my lawyers and I worked diligently around the clock um, preparing because before that I was not allowed to see them. I had, there was no plan. Um, and so you, uh, we, you kept in complete isolation from your family during this nine months that you, you couldn't communicate with them. They, they were allowed to come. Well, so my, my family was here in Florida. Um, okay. I have them here and I was in locked up in uh, Miramar or San Diego, California, and, uh, Marine Corps Miramar station, air station. And uh, so no, they couldn't really come out and see me, but I did have like on Saturdays, you got an hour and a half visitation okay. uh, which really is not much, but then all phone calls are recorded. Um, they're constantly listening to your phone calls, trying to pick apart things. So you, you really can't say much over the phone either. Um, I, I literally just had to put the trust in my wife, my brother, and, um, and most importantly, and in God, um, that, that was huge. And just that, you know, everything would pan out the way it should. And it, it did. We went to trial. Um, I was found innocent of all charges except for one, uh, got me, um, we had a group picture around a ISIS fighter that was killed right. um, I only one charged for that um, but either way but that came out from all the other charges but you know because the uh, because the president got involved and because the Navy had put so much money time and effort into trying to prosecute me and they lost um, their egos would not let it go so the persecution continued after my trial then they tried to take away my retirement um, like my 20 years never existed. Um, and, you know, the president got involved again and uh, was like, just let him retire. Um, they, again, went against what the president put out and then tried to take my trident. It became very embarrassing um, just right. in general because I had so much uh, belief in the command that I worked for to see them act in this manner. It was it was an embarrassment and it was very political. But. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to ask, which is how 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 fucked up is this? I mean, you 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 commit your 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 life, your career uh, to to navies. I mean, there's there's a there's a strong devotion and, and and mission, and it must feel like such a betrayal. That is, yeah. I mean, that's that's a 
the correct word is betrayal. And that's the way I felt uh, the whole time I was locked up. Um, but uh, I'll tell you this, you know, I, I wouldn't give it back for anything. I'm glad that we went through that um, for many reasons, you know, one being that we're now helping others um, that are put in that same situation because we had no idea that any of this even existed. Uh, and, you know, the others, it, it opened my eyes. Um, it opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, every institution is, you know, it's all they are is an institution. They, they're imperfect, just like everywhere else. And, you know, to put your 100% belief into, like I did, into the Naval Special Warfare Institution, I would have, you know, I, I had given my blood, sweat, and tears, soul, uh, Everything. Um, to it. And I would have kept going. I would have kept going until I could have no longer do the job, which would have been, you know, 30 years plus. Um, but I'm glad all that happened because, you know, it's, it made me believe, it made me realize what's really most important in my life. And that's my family and God. And that was, you know, that wouldn't, uh, it, I literally, my wife jokes, she's like, you know, you literally had to be put into a cell and walked away from everybody to realize that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that's it. The gift. That's the gift in this, right? Yeah. Man, what an amazing woman. We should be interviewing her, not you. That's what I always tell people. <laughs> right? You know, they say behind every great man is a better woman, man. And, you know, I don't know if a lot of human beings would have been able to mentally survive and go through that without having that that support and like your wife and your kids. I mean, I could just imagine as a father what, what some of the thoughts you were having and how you were sort of trying to manage that side of things, right? And then you know, your, 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 your brother being, being in your corner. Is that, is that what got you through some of those dark moments? I mean, that's when you, and when you know what I mean, when I say dark moments, it's, it's, yeah. like we we're really thinking like, man, is this ever going to end? And you know, what, 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 what if I end up going to jail for the rest of my life? Yeah, that, I mean, that for sure was a huge factor to get me through, you know, having my wife and brother out there um, fighting for me. And then, you know, I, all of my close friends, um, like Ed Heiner, uh, and they would visit me. I mean, took time out of their day on Saturdays to come visit me for the hour and a half. That was a huge uplift just to knowing you had people that had your back on the outside. And, you know, the other blessing from happening from this happening is, you know, you, you learn who's there for you and who's not in those rough times. And you literally cut the fat out of your life. You're like, okay, you know, no harm, no foul, but I know where you stand. If when times get tough, you're going to sit on the sidelines. Right. But I, I have like real true friends that showed up um, that were advocating for me, fighting for me when it was definitely an unpopular decision to do in my, at my command because they were doing the exact opposite. Um, but, you know, that those all, all those little things definitely helped get me through the dark times. And like, I, I can't overemphasize this enough. Um, you know, I, I've always been a person of faith, um, but it, I wasn't truly a person of faith until this happened. And uh, at, there was a pinnacle moment uh, when I was locked up and I have, you know, I put this in my book. Um, I think I was locked up. I was like three months in and I still had this belief that my command was going to do right by me. I, for some, you know, that's how institutionalized I was. I was like, there's no way that they're, they're doing this to me. There has to be some mistake. And my wife literally on the phone was like, I'm listening to me right now. She's like, no one is coming to help you from your command. No one. She's like, we are all you have. And she told me, she's like, you know, every time you went and deployed, I, you know, I did nine, nine combat deployments. She's like, you always told us it was for a righteous cause. And that's why you were going to do it. And we believed in you. She's like, now I need you to believe in me. No one's coming to get you. We are all that you have. So I walked back to my cell after that phone call because that was a pretty, pretty tough thing to hear. Um, and for the first time in my life, I got on my hands and knees and spoke out loud to God and was just like, I'm giving this to you. Um, Cause I literally was at a wit's end. I was like, I can't, there's nothing I can do in this situation. Um, I gave it all to him, put my faith in him. I said, Hey, whatever happens from this, you know, this is your will. And I'll tell you from that moment on, I literally felt a weight off my shoulders right when I did that. And uh, that's really what helped me persevere through the rest of my time in prison. And then also at the trial. 
man, what? Like, this is war. This is war you went into. I mean, yeah, it was uh, a fight. Yeah, all jokes. The biggest fight of your life. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And this is how you, this is where uh, Piper Foundation? Yeah. So Piper Foundation, uh, that idea was formulated while I was locked up. So uh, I was in military prison. Um, and the prison I was in was all branches. So it was army, Navy, air force, um, and Marines, um, all, you know, prisoners in there. And while I was in there, you know, obviously I was in general population. I met a lot of, and it was a lot of young kids. Um, I, I was probably one of the oldest ones there. Um, but these kids, you know, were like 19, 20, mm -hmm. um, locked up for making mistakes. Like maybe, you know, they might've smoked some weed or, you know, popped on a piss test or, you know, just little, little things that you know, young adults do. Um, mm -hmm. but because they had decided to the raise their right hand to serve their country, they were getting unjustly or not unjustly, but over prosecuted. Mm -hmm. These kids are serving about five to eight years for taking a drag. Joint. So I, I came, you know, I would tell my wife these things when she visited me, it was really bothering me. Um, and so when, and also, the other half of why we started the foundation was I had a first um, set of lawyers that actually worked for a nonprofit that approached me before um, I got locked up and, uh, or I actually approached them um, and they agreed. They're like, Hey, we will take care of you. If something does happen, we'll pay your, pay your legal fees, blah, blah, blah. Um, they ended up being uh, super corrupt. Um, they were trying to, during this time, they were trying to extort my wife for money uh, making threats that they were going to leave me in prison longer. If she did not give, give them this money. And they literally were doing nothing to help my case. Um, and they, these, this group, it's United American Patriots. They have, they have a history of doing this to people. So um, we started this nonprofit. So people have an option um, and they don't have to go to these corrupt nonprofits that aren't doing the right thing. You know, like the first, your story is from adversity to to triumph. I mean, and and I don't think you get to to that triumph without going through the adversity. And you know, just chatting with you, I mean, you you, I could just imagine how strong of a human being you are mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually, and have become going through this. But what is so shocking is that you know, you reach out for help, which is a very vulnerable thing to do, right? You reach out to an association for help, your lawyer for help, your command for help, and and everyone's just trying to fuck you. And not you and, yes, you in this particular situation, but just generally, like, this is what's so awful about the uh, some of these institutions in the world that we're living in is, like, who do you trust and who do you put your faith in? And, and yeah. unfortunately, you don't know, right? You don't know that, like, you know, these corporations and institutions are as corrupt as they are. And, you know, <clears throat> thank God in a lot of cases, these things come out and thank God that you've started this nonprofit, man, this is, this is such important work. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, we've, we've learned since we started it. Um, it's definitely a gap that needs to be filled. Um, and, you know, we've helped out numerous individuals, um, but, you know, we get flooded with grants, you know, every month. And we, we, as a board, they go through them and yay or nay, um, who we're going to help. But, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're grateful for the, the people that we have been able to help so far and we're going to continue to grow. Um, and so we can, you know, start helping a lot, a lot more other people. Awesome. Awesome, man. Uh, love the cause, love what you stand for. We're going to promote and sort of get it out there as much as possible with you guys. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I love what you said earlier, which is, you know, we can't, we can't accept being, being the victim, you know, we got to, you know, when you're working with no. uh, some of the people that you're, you're training and some of the kids and the leadership development you're doing. And I see this all the time. I see it with, with, with close friends and even some family and, and, you know, it's, that's my biggest sort of position with them, which is stop being the fucking victim, right? Yeah. Like this is, what's the action you're going to take? What's the choice you're going to make? What's the decision you're going to make? And more people need to operate with that kind of faith and commitment to say, it's just about me taking the steps versus, versus uh, anything else. Cause it's too easy to become the victim. And if anything from your story, right. It just show that none of us have a right to be a victim, right? No. Specifically if you've gone through this and, and, and you were able to hold that line of, of, of assertiveness and, and focusing and, 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 um, objective. 
Yeah. I mean, and you know, one thing, and I tell people too, and I had to do this when I was locked up, um, is you have to put things into perspective. So yeah, when I, you know, I tell people when I was going through that, you know, when I'm sitting in my cell, um, yeah, I could have sat there and there were times where I did start to feel sorry for myself, where I was angry, like, why is this happening? But you literally have to take a moment, like take a breath, take a step back and put things into perspective. You know, yeah, I was locked up. Yeah, I was facing life in prison, but I still had air in my lungs. I could still get wake up every morning. I had been to enough funerals of my friends who no longer have that option, you know, and their families no longer have their fathers with them. My situation is not even as close as bad to, as theirs. So, you know, I tell people to do that when they're facing adversity as well. Like, hey, you know, if they start feeling sorry for themselves is to take a step back and be like, you know, how bad is your situation really? You know, and yeah, everybody's situation is bad to them, like no matter what. It's, you know, this is the worst thing that's happening to me right now. But if you take that step back, look around you, look at other people who are suffering that are overcoming that suffering, you know, that should give you um, the motivation to start, you know, moving forward and dealing with whatever uh, adversity that you're dealing with. Um, and like you said, all it is is taking that first step forward, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, the, the best piece of advice I ever got when I, when I was locked up was from another SEAL who had been through the same uh, situation I had, was unjustly accused, locked up for three years, and then come to find out the judge was ordered to find him guilty uh, because of the Me Too movement that was going on. So he had sent me just a little card, and all it said on it was, this pain will serve you well someday. That is the most important quote I've ever, ever read. And, you know, that I give that, I pass it on to people as well when they're going through these tough times. I'm like, you know, believe it or not, this pain you're going through, you will overcome and it's going to serve you and you will be a better human being afterwards. I'm just writing that down. That's amazing. This pain will serve you. It's true. I can't. Yeah, that's Keith I, Perry. I, yeah, I think uh, I think that's the challenge in some cases in the world that we live like, you know, we're living in a world of snowflakes and, and, and softness and people don't want to go through the pain. And, and it's it's such an important part of of life and growth and tenacity and resilience. Yeah, I think people don't. I think there is a epidemic of people just wanting to stay as comfortable as possible um, and just being like Pink Floyd comfortably numb. Uh, and that, that is a surefire way to start dying quickly. Um, you know, it's what are you doing with your life? Um, and it's why I, I, you know, I make sure like I could sit back um, and not do anything, but I challenge myself daily. I have my kids challenge themselves daily. You know, we do jujitsu, we go to the range, we work out. Um, we, we put ourselves through tough situations because that is literally afterwards, just those little situations mm -hmm. uh, propels you forward each and every time. Um, and it gives you a better outlook on life. Um, it makes you more empathetic towards other people. Um, and it also, you stop thinking about yourself. You start thinking about others. Um, so I want to ask you, your 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 boys. You have two sons. I have two boys and one daughter. How old were they when uh, this all happened? Um, my oldest at the time was eight. He had just turned eighteen. Um, he was yeah because he, he just graduated and was headed off to college. My daughter was. She had to have been 14. And then my youngest son uh, was eight, I believe. Tough ages. What were the, some of those conversations like with them? It was tough, but like we, we the way my, my wife and I sort of handle things, you know, and I tell people this too is, you know, my kids grew up in the SEAL teams, um, which is a very uh, fast paced, kind of chaotic lifestyle. Um, they had been to more funerals than, you know, kids probably should be at their age. Um, they've seen, they've lost uncles uh, that, you know, they were my brothers. And so they called them uncles. Right, right, right. So they, they had a certain resilience built into them already from growing up in that community. Um, but when this happened, um, I think, and, you know, I'll give all the credit to my wife too, is, you know, we, we didn't sit there and like, Oh, we can't, you know, talk to them. Like, this is bad. I can't believe this is happening. We just kept pushing forward. We're like, this is stupid mm -hmm. that this is happening, but we are going to continue on with our lives until 
we can't. And then once I was locked up, you know, I had a conversation with each of them. I think the second day I was locked up and I just told them, I was like, you know, just like I did on every deployment, you just keep living your life. I'll be back home. I was like, it's don't worry about me. I'm coming home. And they all took that on board and they were like, you know, Roger that, which, you know, not to say that they weren't going through some rough times. They definitely did. Um, but like I said, they're very resilient children. Um, and also we refuse to let them have a victim mentality. So, and they're fighters. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it definitely helped them grow as well. You know, they say the greatest uh, parenting tool, the greatest way to teach your kids is to role model the behavior that you want to see, to act and behave um, the way you want them to be, right? And uh, man, they must, uh, they must have had, uh, as you said, maybe adversity, but uh, um, have grown a lot from this. What do your kids want to yeah. do? I got to ask, do they have any idea of what direction they want to go in life? Uh, so my oldest, he is uh, a couple classes short um, of getting his degree in chemistry. Um, and so he'll be done with college here soon. My daughter just started college this year. Mm -hmm. um, she's getting a nursing degree. She wants to go into that, that field. And uh, my youngest is the, uh, he's a wild child. So we <laughs> will see. <laughs> we'll see where he goes, right? yeah, we'll see where he goes. He's uh, got a strong personality, but uh, yeah, we're, we're just trying to get him through eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> one step at a time. Right. right. Um, okay. One more question just on this topic and then we'll switch. Um, so for people to go into the military today, to go into the uh, into the Navy, what 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 advice or or what what thoughts would you share? You know, like when I got asked that question a lot, uh, right when I got out, um, you know, would you let your kids join? Yes, I have no, I have no issues, I have no regret about being in the military. I think it's one of the uh, highest callings you can do. Um, you know, because I, I and again, this is how I also view this, and I. I beg people to view other things this way as well. You know, I'm not mad at the Navy. I'm not mad at my command. There are certain individuals that made some bad decisions. That does not encompass the whole SEAL teams, you right. know. Uh, you know, and I have my closest friends uh, still in, still active duty. Um, it's It was the best job, you know, that I ever had. I got to work with the best people. So, you know, I... I would always said, you know, if my kids wanted to join, I would be a hundred percent behind them. Um, you know, now obviously over the past couple of years, uh, the way sort of the military is shifting and putting this whole woke ideology and they're, they're focusing more on, you know, I don't diversity and this gender, whatever you want to call it, right. instead of actually becoming a fighting force, a lethal fighting force to defend this nation. It is a little hard to tell people, you know, to go in right now. But I would say if they are going to join, um, I would say make it work for them. Um, find out all the benefits that you're going to be able to get when you join. Find out all the opportunities um, that the Navy or any branch provides and make sure you use those to make, you know, get what you can out of the Navy or, the you know, the military in general, because they're going to take whatever they can out of you. Um, that's, you know, not even a question. So um, I'd say go in there with a plan um, and definitely use it to get your degree as well. Yeah, cool. One more question. Um, have you gotten an invite to go play golf with uh, President Trump yet? <laughs> no, I haven't gotten an invite to play golf. With I think yet. you got to tweet him and be like, hey, bro, where's, let, yeah. <laughs> let, let's, hit, let's, hit, let's hit some 18. He's, uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely a busy man. He's, you know, I've had a couple phone calls with him since I've been out, um, you know, and, uh, I've become really, really good friends with, uh, Eric Trump, uh, his son, that guy is, he's phenomenal. Just one of the best human beings, uh, you could be around, but, uh, no, I have, he's a, that well, Donald's pretty busy. Um, right, 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 right. Well, <laughs> still one day, I'm sure there'll be the golf tournament that you'll get your, your invite to. Yeah. That'll be, uh, if I do get invited, I'll probably send my brother in my place because he's an avid golfer. Right. I was going to say, you just can't fuck up in the golf game, right? Gotta, yeah. <laughs> I have to go <laughs> train, <laughs> replace the guns with a, with, with a golf bag. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay. I want to ask, fuck around and find out. Tell me about that. Uh, so that is the sort of the brand um, that we created uh, when we got out and that also formulated um, 
around my wife, uh, you know, while she was combating the government and the media, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were losing their minds that she was just destroying them at every angle, but they would also, where they were still pulling all sorts of shit all the way up into the end. And my wife was just crushing them each and every time. And so, uh, I think, I believe it was one time when she was visiting me, they had recently just pulled something I, and I can't remember there were so many, but she crushed them right off the bat. And she was just like, fuck around and find out. She's like, and, uh, that's from awesome. there, I was like, that's, that's our motto, uh, going through this, uh, going through the trial. So we started that brand when we got out and that's sort of, you know, it's developed into this mentality, um, that I think everybody should have, you know, and it's not, I think people look at it as like an aggressive statement, but it's more of no, like I'm cool. You're cool. Let's be cool. Um, but if you want to have a problem, then we can get down. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're prepared to defend ourselves, uh, in every way possible. So that's sort of what that, what that entails. Hey, so sorry to interrupt and thank you for listening. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you like today's episode and you want to learn more about some of our programs, like the Better Leader Program that can change your life, go ahead and click the link below. So I, I know you guys do this and, and, and you have a game plan through your own experience, but just some top things like uh, to combat the media. Like let's say, let's say someone's um, starting to experience some of this pressure or, or you know, they're, they're going up against it. What are some some things they can do? What are some best practices? What's, what, what are some of the things from your playbook? Uh, well, I'll tell you, the first thing is uh, limit your media time. Um, you know, I, I, tell, I tell my parents this all the time, you know, stop watching the news, stop watching the media. It's all fear mongering. Um, and none of it is the truth, no matter what side you're on. It's all curtailed to make you feel a certain way and to put stress on your life. Um, so, that's my first thing is stop watching it. Um, but if you are involved and if they are coming after you or they're putting certain things out about you or maybe somebody that you care about, mm -hmm. um, my first thing would be don't be reactionary to all of it. Um, you know, cause I think it's a definitely a human instinct. And I went through this as well, even after I got out when they were still coming after me and, um, you want to, you know, you want to react to it and you're like, you know, why are they doing this? And we need to, we need to like come back and do something. And that's not the answer. Uh, you know, they're going to put out what they're going to put out. Um, and you can choose to respond to it, but take the time before you do, um, don't do it while you're emotional, uh, because nothing will ever good will ever come out of that. You'll, you'll end up saying something you'll regret. So I would say, you know, again, take that deep breath, think about how you want to respond. And then also look, look at who's putting it out. Look at, look at who is putting that information or, you know, I've had, you know, there's still some media outlets that are still, they still come after me to this day. Um, you know, I had, I'll give you a recent example. I, I had uh, trained a, uh, the Tallahassee, SWAT department uh, down here at the range. We went and watched them. We observed them do an active shooter drill at their at the school, and it was you know a big uh, a big like dog and pony show. Um, and, and there were some loopholes that we saw myself and some other uh, operators that were there. And we so we offered, hey, we'll give you a full free day of training down on our range, and just go over some things that could you know help you clear these structures a little bit better and mitigate risk to yourselves. They came down for a whole day, had a great time, great training. They all loved it. And then the next day, some Tallahassee journalist put out that, you know, war criminal Eddie Gallagher is now teaching cops how to be, you know, war criminal, whatever, you know, some, I forget exactly what they said. Um, and it didn't matter. It's to me, that is, that person's a peon. You know, I'm like, I could either give this person the time of day and start coming, you know, going back and forth, or I can just move on with my life. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I'll tell people is the media is about 40 or was it 48 to 72 hours. And then, you know, the, the script flips, the right? Yeah. Yeah. So just wait it out. It'll mm -hmm. disappear. Um, yeah. And that's move good. on with your life. And I think what I heard you say there, I'll just paraphrase it. Just know your truth. Just know your yeah. truth. 
know who you you are, know what you stand for, you know, know stay stay calm. I think that's that's a lot of good advice in business and in, in military and in, in, in how do you remain calm, you know, when we're not calm, we're jacked. When we're jacked, we're reactive, you know, it's the amygdala going and that's that's the thing we're trying to manage. And also what you can do too, and this is no, not just media, this is just life advice in general. If somebody does say something mm -hmm. uh, negative about you that you don't like, and maybe it starts to enrage you, well, why is it enraging you? May, is there some truth to it? Maybe mm -hmm. take a look at yourself and be like, am I what this person is saying? But at the end of the day, you're like, no, I'm not. Okay, well then keep moving. Uh, you know, that's very cool. People. Harder, uh, easier said than done, right? But oh, yeah. yeah, and what we try to remind people of is this isn't these things you don't just do, you practice them, right? Like you practice them in the moment, all right? And to your point is, is, is why am I getting so hooked, right? Um, is there truth? Am I offended? Am I, you know, am I righteous? Uh, but uh, what it usually starts to poke at is it pokes at our identity and it's a real core value to us, right? It's a mm -hmm. part of our human needs. So uh, first, I want to come down and do some shooting with you. I want to come over to Florida and run through some of your courses. So we're going to have to yeah. arrange that at some point. Uh, I was watching some of your videos. Super cool, man. Super, super cool. I'm down in Costa Rica now, and uh, I'm, oh, li nice. I'm licensed up in Canada, which getting guns in Canada now is like, it's like <laughs> pulling teeth. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the problem is they, they take the guns away, right? I mean, this is the fucking beginning of it, right? Um, someone was just telling me the other day, I've just uh, become friends, um, retired special forces uh, down here. And in Canada, when you, when you have your licenses, you have your, hand, uh, your short gun, your handgun license, your long gun license, but then you need a travel document. And travel document that says you could drive your gun from your house to your gun club, and that's where you could shoot it, right? Anyway, I suppose they've just removed the tra travel documents for your handguns, right? Which is problematic. It's a major, major, major problem. I mean, this is what you saw happen in Australia, if you want to get into sort of why they were also so locked down. Took all the guns yep. away in the 90s, right? And, you know, at that point, I think it's, uh, it's important. Anyway, I'm trying to get my guns down here, but it's a little more difficult until I get residency and stuff. So until then, I'll just come over and hang out in Florida for a little bit. And oh, we got it. We got guns you need here in Florida. I, I figured you do. <laughs> I'll, never, I'll tell you a quick story. I'll never forget this. I'm down working with a client in Lafayette, Indiana. Okay. Like one of these towns, like one bar, one hotel, six gun. Okay. Clubs. I'm from Indiana. Okay. All right. Lafayette was where I was. Right. Anyway, we're driving in and I see the sign and it says guns kill like spoons, make people fat. And I'm with a, I'm with a, I'm with a, a colleague of mine. I'm like, bro, we got to pull in here. Right. So we pull in and it is, it's like a, it's, it's like a toy store. It's the most unbelievable thing. Anyway, everything's being pulled out. And I'm like, can I ship one of these guns? And he's like, absolutely. We could ship it for you. And he's like, where I'm like Canada. And he picked the gun off the table. He said, ah, 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 ah. he's like, y'all Canadians are too restrictive. And, um, <laughs> That was my, my experience in a, in, a, in a gun store in Lafayette, Indiana. I've never <laughs> forgotten that story, but we had a great time that day. All right. I want to ask you a couple more questions. You've been doing some work with, uh, you know, um, high school students, university students, high school students. High school students. High school students, and you've been working on them around leadership. I think it's such an important thing that we can start to develop in high school students. Um, um, and in sort of the kids today, what are some of the things that you think are in, when you're teaching them leadership, when you're working them through, what are you working them on? What are you teaching them? What are some of the important things that we're trying to create from a foundational standpoint? Well, for one, you know, the, just teaching them how to be men, first off, like, I mean, simple things, you know, how, how do you tie a tie? How do you, you know, do res, you know, write a resume, um, Mm -hmm. just simple things every man should know, but I don't think it's being passed down to these kids nowadays. You know, everybody's on their phone doing, you know, distracted. And, but then also the big thing, which I, I love doing is, uh, you know, I put them through a little bit of pain on uh, adversity. I, I got, I get the logs out. Um, I had them do some log PT. Cool. Uh, and I, I let them know beforehand. I'm like, you know, this next hour and a half will be miserable. Um, just be prepared for that. And you will feel some pain, but the reason we have this log and you have 
you know, five other, other individuals underneath the same log, you guys are all feeling the same pain. So when you start feeling sorry for yourself under that log and, you know, you're starting to feel that pain creep in and you don't, you know, you think about the person to your right and left, like, how are they feeling and what are you doing to mitigate their pain? And they should be thinking the same thing about you. They're trying to mitigate your pain. They're trying to put as much effort into holding that log up. Um, and that's sort of like the lesson that happens through that hour and a half, because these kids, um, you know, you'll have some of them that'll, they'll want to quit. Uh, they'll, you know, get on their hands and knees, you know, and they're, they're like, this is, this is horrible, but you just tell them like, you know, have them look at, have them look at their friends under the log and be like, well, what do you, how do you think they feel? Mm-hmm. And like, why are you thinking about yourself right now right. instead of about them? Right. And it really, and I, it was so awesome to see that sink into them and they get up and they get back under the log and they're motivated, right. um, you know, and then you give them a talk afterwards, uh, just about, you know, first how well they did. Um, but then, you know, to pass what they learned in this hour and a half on to other individuals. Um, and that, that to me is truly like probably one of the biggest things you can do because you can sit up there and give these kids classes all day on, Hey, you know, be resilient, do this and do that. Well, they're not going to learn it unless you put them through it, unless you went through some physical adversity or mental adversity. Um, you know, it's funny with uh, what you just said about resilience, because I've said this for years and corporately, you know, we just can, can you do resilience training? And I'm like, what the fuck do you want me to do with them? You want me to hit them and yell at them and beat them and, <laughs> you know, put them through some of the school of, of lessons that I went through that allowed me to be like, okay, this is, this is something we're going to have to work through because resilience, I, you, we might argue is it's an outcome. It's an outcome to, to the pain that's going to serve you one day. Right. That is that. That's probably actually one of the best definitions I've heard is it is an outcome. Um, it, you know, and I, I've gotten to discussions whether, you know, resilience can be taught uh, or can it be um, earned over time? Um, like experience. And, yeah. Through right. experience. You know, I think it can be uh, learned over time through experience. Um, mm-hmm. but I don't think it can be taught in a classroom. I don't think you can give a, you know, half hour lecture on how to be resilient and then think that people are going to walk out of there, um, being resilient. You know, I, people ask all the time, like, Oh, you know, coming from the special forces community or, you know, the seal community, um, you know, you guys are so resilient and like, how, how does that happen? And I'm like, well, it's, you become resilient before you even join the seals um you have to put in the time the work um to prepare right and that's you know years of you know working out um making sure you're doing everything you know dieting and doing everything correctly to prepare yourself the best way so when you get to buds you have a successful um time there and so if you you put in that work beforehand you're already building resilience before you get there and then obviously through buds, um, you definitely add some resilience on there. And then through your career, we are constantly going to these schools, um, like not nonstop training. And, you know, these schools that we go to, you're always under a microscope, you know, you're always expected to perform at the top level. So you have that pressure all the time, um, which then also builds resilience when you come out on top. So it's, it's just basically, you know, being, you know, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. Um, I think in doing the work, I mean, let's just, you know, back to this woke, woke world that we're living in and the sort of softness and everyone's tired and fatigued and sensitive and anxious and depressed. Fuck, that's life. That's work, right? These are the the things that, that I need to keep uh, pushing through. And, you know, there's that wonderful saying, which is life will serve you lessons. And when you haven't learned them, they'll serve them to you again. (laughs) <laughs> yes. right i think it's like the universe will serve them again but uh that's our responsibility man your story is amazing really amazing tell us a little bit about where we could get your book and uh where the audience can maybe um learn more about you come do some you know firearms training with you all that good stuff sure i appreciate it uh yeah the, the book uh again it's uh the man in the arena um, you can get it, uh, you can order it off Amazon, um, or I have, uh, the Eddie Gallagher book.com. Um, you can order it off there, or you go to my website, the Eddie Gallagher, there's an option to, um, 
order it off there as well. And you also have the option if you wanted to get it uh, signed or have a message written in it. Um, there's that option as well. Um, and then, you know, the Eddie Gallagher.com is my website um, underneath, underneath that website. It has all, all the um, stuff that I'm part of and doing. So like the range um, you can sign up for classes through there. Um, it's the range is at stronghold soft solutions um, down here in uh, Defuniac Springs, Florida. Um, and also I'm on, you know, Instagram, uh, Eddie underscore Gallagher, uh, at Instagram. And I also have the links below, um, to go to all, each of each and one of those. Yes. And then, and specifically uh, the pipe hitter foundation as well. Yeah. So last but not least, uh, the pipe hitter foundation, um, you go on pipe foundation.org. Um, you can get on there. You can see uh, all the individuals that we've helped out so far and their stories. Um, you can also contribute, um, to their, um, legal defense if we're, we're currently still helping them. Um, and then if you are in need or in help of, or you need help, then you can fill out a grant on that, uh, website as well. And mm -hmm. then like that, that is checked monthly. You know, the board has a convenes and we go through each recipient. Amazing, <clears throat> Amazing work. Amazing work. To the audience, that's the Pipe, P-I-P-E, Hitter, H-I-T-T-E-R Foundation and eddiegallagher.com. We're going to put all of this information, the links to, to your website, to your books, to uh, your org, and to the range um, in the footnotes. So to the audience, you know, go check out Eddie. He's doing amazing work. Dude, I could spend another like four hours with you just chatting and like getting into more details, but you know, we'll, have to, book, we'll have to book a part two. Yeah. Um, at the end of each episode, we come to our, our uh, famous signature question, right? The better human question. And you, you've spoken a lot about this and, and I think you've answered it in several ways, but you know, let's just try to, well, uh, I'll ask it anyway. What do you think we could all do to be better humans tomorrow? I think there, there's, I think that's like a, a wide, there's a lot of things that we could do. Um, but I would say, you know, work on being more empathetic to other individuals, um, you know, learn how to learn how to, to uh, agree to disagree. You know, I think there's this country is so divided right now and everybody puts a label on each other. Um, the world like, is divided and dialogue is gone. There's no more. I disagree with you. Tell me more about your thoughts. It's like, how dare you have that position and thought? Exactly. You know, stop. And I would say, you know, stop having that mindset. Um, it's have a conversation with somebody, have a conversation with somebody that has different points of view than you rather than have one, you know, being in an echo chamber of everybody like, yeah, we're all right. You know, you might learn something. Um, and that person might learn something as well. And, you know, also with this country being so divided and I get asked all the time, like, you know, what are we going to do? It's like, well, wh what can you do about it? What, what can you do to fix your situation right now? And now all you can do is control the things around you, you know, mm -hmm. control what you're, isn't most important to you, you know, whether it be your family, uh, your friends, or, you know, your job, or, you know, making yourself a better person, uh, whether if you're into jujitsu or working out or whatever, I mean, focus on those things. All that other stuff is just white noise. It's going to keep happening. You know, um, and if you focus on that, then yeah, your life is going to be stressed out. Um, and you're probably going to be a little bit depressed. <laughs> Right, right. And maybe that depression is a little bit of your body and your mind telling you something to do something. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Uh, Eddie Gallagher, you are the man, brother. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for having me on, brother. And yeah, definitely do it again. For sure, we're going to do it again. And maybe we'll bring our buddy Ed Heiner in, Ironhead. Huh? Oh, I love it. All right. On that note to the audience, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like it. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share. And we will see you next week. Hey, thanks for listening today. And if you enjoyed today's episode, you're going to love the next one.